The country continues to mourn the loss of Nancy Reagan. The 94-year-old died today in her Los Angeles home from heart failure. She's remembered for having redefined the role of the First Lady, often inserting herself in the politics of her husband's presidency. Our senior White House correspondent, Bill Plant, and Susan Zarinsky, the executive producer of 48 Hours, covered the Reagan administration and both join me now. Uh, Bill, I would like to start with you. Can you talk a little bit about Nancy Reagan's legacy? You know, when she first became First Lady, our impression of her, having watched her all through the campaign, was that she was this adoring little wife who did nothing but gaze up at her husband whenever he spoke. And it was clear that they were very, very close. They would hug and kiss in public all the time. But nobody gave much of a thought to the power that she did become. And when she was First Lady, the first impression that we got was beginning of the 80s, the recessions in full bloom. She raises $800,000 from private sources to redecorate the White House and to buy $200,000 worth of new China. Well, that brought down criticism from everywhere. And uh, she became known as Queen Nancy. Uh, she did have a sense of humor. She spoofed her spending habits once during the annual gridiron dinner, a dinner here in Washington with the press and the president usually in attendance. And she sang a takeoff called Secondhand Clothes. And everybody, you know, loved it. So she did have a sense of humor, but she was mainly dedicated to protecting, defending, and working with her husband. And we knew, uh, as time went on, that she really was a power behind the throne. Uh, she was much more than just the adoring wife. She allied with the deputy chief of staff, Michael Deaver, and the chief of staff in President Reagan's first term, James Baker, to uh, decide pretty much what went on no matter what others in the administration wanted. Uh, she definitely influenced the decisions the president took. And uh, she eventually uh, got the second chief of staff, Ronald, uh, Ronald Reagan, fired. Uh, and he <laughs> got his revenge by writing in a book later that she consulted astrologers uh, to determine when her husband should do things like take off on Air Force One. So. Uh, there is no question but that she was a major force in his presidency, in addition to being his real handmaiden and love of his life, and vice versa. That's Bill, I see Susan nodding in agreement here with me in the studio. And it, it, really, she was kind of talked about as his top advisor and protector. Can you talk about that a little bit? She absolutely was. Um, she had a particular disdain for the press, I might add. Um, there was one famous incident, and I, I believe it was Bill who was up at the ranch, and it was at a time when the U.S.-Russian talks on nuclear disarmament were really stuck. And Reagan was fumfering around. Somebody had asked him a question. And Nancy Reagan, under her breath, said, we're doing all we can. And Reagan then said, we're doing all we can. It became a real point of controversy. She said, I was talking to myself. Uh, everybody in the press corps thought, well, she's just cueing her dear, her dear love of her life, Ronnie. And we could actually see on the video when we went back to look at the videotape, as we like to say, her mouthing the words and then him. Um, I, you know, we, uh, in, I was the White House producer with Bill and Leslie Stahl for many years. And what was really interesting was we were able to listen in on the Secret Service back then. There were no scramblers. And I learned an awful lot about Nancy Reagan by listening into the Secret Service and also the Navy staff, which had the people that fed her. Ate a lot of fruit, didn't want Ronnie to eat bad things when he asked for them. And we actually knew movements of the president by listening to the Secret Service. That's Sue. I want to point out that their pictures, you spent a great deal of time uh, within covering this administration, but you also spent time with both of them as well, just as human beings. Can you tell us a little bit about, we've heard she was tough, uh, that sometimes on staffers she was tough. She, well, Bill told the story about Don Regan, like when they crossed as a chief of staff, uh, he went bye-bye. Um, you know, the president, when he was up at the ranch, often we would go up to record the radio, the Saturday radio address, and he, as a joke, would say, the Russians are going to bomb, and she was very upset. So I bought this sign, actually, CBS Radio provided it, that said, open mic, and, like, flashed on and off, and he made some joke. He says, Nancy won't think that's big enough. But my favorite story, which Bill will remember, was uh, when they went to the ranch, obviously the press was kept...
miles away, like in a different city. We developed a gigantic lens, literally from NASA. We were on the next mountain over, but we could really look in at Reagan and Nancy at the ranch when they walked outside. Local Santa Barbara Press did a story and showed a picture of this mega lens, and she was so worried she put a curtain on her bathroom window because she thought we could look in. We couldn't quite do that, and I never used a picture of Ronald Reagan in his red little bathrobe. I thought that was going a little far. But she, there was just definite controversy between her and the press. Right, Bill? That's for sure. Uh, she was always worried about what we would say about her husband, and often for a very good reason, because there was a lot of critical coverage of what he did as president. I don't mean critical in the sense that people were trying desperately to bring him down, only that... Uh, there were controversial things which he did in the world of disarmament, uh, in the world of uh, economics. So she was his protector, and she did her very best through the staff to make sure that everything he said and every appointment that he had, every major trip that he took, uh, was set up in the best possible way as she saw it. Well, Bill, that's, you know, she was the protector, but they often described uh, the former president as Teflon and said that she was much stickier. Uh, can you describe kind of how they, they, they were different, but they helped each other because of their differences? Absolutely. She did. She deflected all of the criticism. I mean, Ronald Reagan uh, to this day is in, enjoys a certain mythical status, particularly among Republicans. Uh, and even when he was president, his... Uh, he was less subject to criticism than she was because she made herself available to deflect that criticism. She let herself be the target in so many instances, and they did compliment one another, and they knew it. Z, I do think it's interesting, though. Uh, she, very early on, when she was being criticized, especially in the press, her feelings were hurt, and she talked about that later on. Yes, yeah, she did some really good interviews with Mike Wallace along the way, the legendary 60 Minutes producer. She did get her feelings hurt, but she was an actress, and she was able to, what I put, what I call, put on your game face. You know, she, she didn't care if people criticized that she wore Oscar de la Renta or John Galanos. Um, I can remember Plant and I would spend our Christmas and New Year's with the Reagans, and I remember calling my own family and saying, I'm, I'm in Palm Springs with the president. My mother said, how exciting. I said, you don't get this. I'm watching Nancy Reagan and her friends in these dripping jewels walk into this house. I'm on the highway with a cameraman. It's not quite the same. But she made no apologies. I think she really did care. And, you know, she took the issue of drugs and really ran with it. Just say no. And that was a really uh, decent position. And she worked hard on it over the years, even after she left. And also, when the president left office and it was discovered he had Alzheimer's, she took a very tough stand about stem cell and became an advocate because she saw the research and knew what it could do in spite of where the Republicans stood on that issue. So she, you know what? She had guts. And even if she didn't like us, she had guts, and I respect that. Well, and that's, Bill, I think, um, you know, Sue was just touching on that topic. I, I think what's interesting is she did break away in 2001, and really people say that that kind of, when you look at her legacy in breaking away uh, from the Republican establishment when it came to embryonic stem cell research, um, really will change her legacy. I think it will, and there's something else earlier that we haven't mentioned yet. She was instrumental in getting President Reagan to focus on and mention out loud the AIDS crisis. Remember, they came from a Hollywood right. background. They knew a lot of gay people who, of course, at that time were probably mostly all in the closet. But she knew and was sympathetic to and understood what this terrible disease was about. And she got him to address it in public and to get funding for research. And as you mentioned, the embryonic stem cell stance that she took did put her at odds with a lot of people in the Republican Party. But she believed firmly that it needed to go ahead and said so. How, how does go ahead? Yeah, uh, you know, it would, the, the AIDS thing was a very, very, very big deal. So here you have these like major issues, and she's really separating herself out. So you know, in her legacy, you will look at somebody who was fiercely loyal to somebody who really, you know, she was a decent actress. She was a smart woman. Um, but she, uh, you know, sublimated herself for the president of the United States. And I really do admire that she took all these stands. 
you know, really against where a lot of the Republicans, and she wasn't afraid of him, and she felt that people would follow her. I think Bill will agree on that, but I forgot about the AIDS crisis, and she was very, very instrumental in, in positioning herself on that. Yeah, besides that, I think what's interesting when you look at her is that she is somebody who, um, you know, after her president's, uh, her husband's presidency, that she's a first lady that's looked at, that she brought up issues. Um, she took on social issues like the AIDS crisis and that type of thing. And now other first ladies are having to build off of that. I know Michelle Obama, uh, she, Nancy Reagan was one of the first people she called uh, Bill asking for advice when she was entering the White House. And uh, Mrs. Reagan also is credited by Barbara Bush with advice and uh, by, uh, uh, by the first President Bush's wife and also by uh, President George W. Bush's wife and by Hillary Clinton. They all talked to her about the role of the First Lady, which had begun to expand and change for a new generation by the time she took it over and they followed. So she did break a path in that in that way. Z, do you find that interesting that she came in at a time when feminism, people kind of thought she was bucking it a little bit because she had been uh, this Hollywood wife and now was gazing at her husband and then ended up by the end of the presidency taking on so many other issues? I think that uh, Bill had said this at the beginning, you know, she looked kind of meek and gazing. And you know what? She's a pistol. And I think Ronald Reagan loved her for that. And so here was the beginning of the women's era where women were really changing their positions of power. And she came in in what everybody would expect. But man, oh man, that dynamite was was ready to explode. One other kind of funny thing, which I know Bill will kind of uh, chuckle about, um, they had an odd family. You know, they had two children that were from his first marriage to actress Jane Wyman, and they didn't quite like the other two children. And it was one of those normal, very American, kind of dysfunctional families. <laughs> and that was a collection of really great people. I must admit, I used to love listening to the Secret Service because they didn't know I was listening, and what they were talking about was great. If I ever write a book, I have great <laughs> notes. <laughs> great notes. Oh, boy. That's Bill, did you, did you find the same thing to be true? Absolutely. I mean, she was a major force uh, and a feminist when she came. We just didn't know it. She did it in her own style, and it became evident before she died. You know, long you, before she died. When you bring up the children, that ca became a point of conten contention later in life. I mean, she, you know, there were a number of fights between. Oh, her, it, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, you had Patty Davis, who was like, who took her mother's name and who had married the yoga teacher. And, you know, I remember when we were first in the press corps and we got word that there was going to be this wedding and who was it? And everyone's going, a yoga teacher? She's marrying a yoga teacher? He ended up being a, a nice guy. And then there was Michael Reagan and Maureen. And it was a pile of stuff. Um, but she had this kind of direct sensibility. And she was not going to let anybody infringe on the president of the United States. So she was criticized for kind of keeping people sometimes at distance and not talking to them. I think she knew exactly what she was doing. That's Bill. Earlier we were talking to Leslie Stahl, um, and she was telling us about how after the assassination attempt on his life, um, kind of how things changed a little bit. She became so much more protective uh, of her husband and actually asked him not to run uh, for re-election in 1984. Can you tell us some stories from, from that time period? She did become far more protective after he was shot and almost died. We didn't really know until, oh, six or eight months later, how serious his wounds had been. He could very easily have perished. And that only intensified her determination to protect him. And you're right, she would have preferred that he not run for a second term, but he wanted to. And certainly the people around him, the other advisors, wanted him to, and he did prevail. But it's because of her concern for him uh, and for his life, really, that she did demur. I mean, it was interesting. After the assassination attempt, that's kind of when she started to consult the astrologers. I think she felt out of control and didn't really have the relationship with her kids to, to solidify her. And yet, you know, the president almost died. So she was just in search for something to fill that hole. Um, it's very interesting. There were those of us in the press corps that were convinced that she would win out and he wouldn't run on a second term. Really? As a matter of fact, there was a dinner. And, Bill, I think you were part of this. I know Leslie was with Jim Baker 
up in Santa Barbara um, when he was kind of determining whether or not to run. And I was so convinced. I put money on the table with Jim Baker, and I said, that man is not going to run. Nancy Reagan does not want him to run. And he took the bet, and he appeared on Face the Nation a couple of days later, and he said, I'll let you out of your bet for 70 cents to the dollar. And I sent him a note to the White House the next day. I said, I'm increasing it to 100 bucks. And when I lost the bet, I framed the $100, and I handed it to Jim Baker with a frame and a rubber hammer, and it said, break if elected. When he was Treasury Secretary, he had it as an emergency $100 for the deficit. I don't think he ever broke it. But that's how convinced I was that she would win out and he wouldn't run again. Well, that's Bill. There's also been so much talk about how she would try to influence the president and even at dinner parties and things like that would invite certain guests that if she wasn't getting her way with the president, that hopefully the guests would be able to get their way with the president. That's uh, absolutely right. She set up these small dinner parties in the White House. She brought people in that she thought he should hear from, and he did. I can't think of a specific instance right at the moment, but it did happen, and it happened quite often, really. She opened him up to a number of views. Now, for example, people did not understand, particularly in his first term, that Ronald Reagan was absolutely opposed to the use of nuclear weapons. There was a popular image of him among those who didn't care for him as the cowboy with his finger on the nuclear trigger. Well, in fact, we know from what he himself wrote in his diary, that he was absolutely opposed to the idea of using nuclear weapons at all. And when he did meet uh, with, uh, with the Russians and eventually tried to get them to give up all their nuclear weapons, the American establishment was shocked. It didn't happen. But it was something that she helped him formulate. She was very much in favor of pushing this idea that war was not ever going to happen. You know, I want to go back to one thing, Anna, as we're looking at these pictures. I mean, um, several years ago, I can't remember when, when she, the book was published about her love letters, you know, here was this really unusual, dynamic woman who, as Bill said, you know, came in. None of us suspected that she would be that dominant a force. It was at a time when feminism was at, a, at an interesting place. And yet, like, who has a relationship like that? I, I don't know. Writing I, love letters right. every couple no days. No offense to part. my husband, who I've been married to for a long time, but, like, I don't write him love letters. I don't know that I ever wrote him a love letter. <laughs> um, it, was, it was just in a unique relationship, just a, one that you had to step back and kind of admire. And, and Bill saw it firsthand, I know, closer than I as the White House correspondent. Yeah, a Hollywood story straight to the White House. From the beginning, Susan Zerinsky, Zer Zer excuse me, and Bill Plant. Thank you both so much. So many fascinating stories. We really appreciate both of you being with us today. Pleasure.